Good morning, folks. It's Diamond with the Oppenheimer Ranch Project Magnetic Reversal News and Shinrin Yoku, bringing you a Grand Solar Minimum Update Sunday, December 12th, around noontime, Mountain Time 2021. A huge storm has crushed the West, and more snow is coming. It's looking like a white Christmas for many people in the upper 48. But the big story, rescuers hunt for survivors after deadly tornado rips through several states. Keep calm. It's boom time. Now, this was devastating, and many twisters, and many people lost their lives. And we're going to get to that. Here's the live update. Death toll rises as states assess damage. At least 90 people have now lost their lives in the devastating storms on Friday night, including 80 in Kentucky, which was badly hit. Rescue workers resumed their efforts today, this morning, and residents took stock of devastation like none of us have ever seen before. When, in fact, there actually is another tornado outbreak 10 years ago, and we'll talk about it in just a moment. The devastation included St. Louis, where seven people lost their lives, six of which uh, were working in an Amazon warehouse collapse after the tornado. And the scumbag who owns Amazon, Bezos, didn't even comment on this uh, devastation while his giant penis was shot off into space. Six people died in one of his warehouses, and well, all he wanted to do was get <laughs> Michael Strahan to space. Now, here are some of the devastation. Um, and it is epic. So say a prayer to those people as you watch the video. At least 100 people are feared to be dead after tornadoes ripped through Kentucky over the weekend in what U.S. President Joe Biden called one of the largest tornado outbreaks in the nation's history, leaving a 200-mile trail of destruction across the American South and Midwest. The powerful twisters leveled much of the town of Mayfield, home to some 10,000 people in southwestern Kentucky. Janet Kemp's house was obliterated by the storm. You know, seven, my house burnt completely to the ground. We rebuilt. Then my husband died in 09. And I had to file bankruptcy. I lost everything again. And now I've lost it all again. Kentucky Governor Andy Bashir says nearly 200 National Guard personnel have been deployed to assist with the recovery while Biden has directed federal resources to be delivered to hardest hit areas immediately. Earlier today, I called the governor. Mm, I don't want to listen to that guy, but you can see the scale of the devastation there, and it is, well, it is tragic, but not as tragic as the 2011 super outbreak. Now, the 2011 super outbreak coincides with the same exact spot on the solar cycle where we are now. We are over a year into solar cycle 25, and a little over two years into solar cycle 24, the 2011 outbreak occurred. Same spot in the weakening solar cycle pattern that we've been seeing for decades. Now, the 2011 super outbreak, a total of 348 people were killed as a result of this outbreak, including three, 324 tornado-related deaths and 24 fatalities from thunderstorms alone. April 27th, 2011, Tornado outbreak hit 15 states with over 175 tornadoes striking Alabama, Mississippi, and Tennessee alone. So the 2011 super outbreak, three times more destructive, maybe a little larger than the current outbreak, and has nothing to do uh, with global warming. It has everything to do with the breakdown of the magnetosphere, uh, the collapsing jet stream, and our descent into the grand solar minimum. So what we should see is in about 10 years, in 2032 or so, another devastating outbreak. And that's just based on facts. And the cleanup begins. Strong winds blow through Michigan, nearly 200,000 without power Saturday. And so this storm moved east, and it took out almost a half a million customers that's hundreds of thousands of people without power this morning, and they linger. And here we can see the current live update from Power Outage US, 200,000 in Michigan without power, 106,000 in New York, 50,000 in K Kentucky, 23,000 in Tennessee, Pennsylvania getting hit as the storm moves east. So hundreds of thousands without power, dozens if not hundreds of structures and homes lost, and up to 100 lives. And our prayers go out to all the people in the Midwest suffering. 
at this time. It's not just tornadoes. Hawaii storm breaks records, and this was the storm that happened days before the a day before the tornado breakout. And the slow-moving storm drifted away from the Aloha State, but not before setting daily rainfall records, including Honolulu, which recorded 7.92 inches of rain on December 7th, making it the second highest single-day rainfall total ever behind the March 5th, 1958, when 15 inches. So that is epic. You can see here 7.9 at number two pales in comparison to 15.3 inches that fell over 60 years ago back in 1958. And it was also skiing. There was a blizzard on top of Mauna Loa. Powerful storm headed to the Sierra Nevadas and Northern California could bring more heavy rains and up to 10 feet of snow. And that's 100 inches alone just for Tahoe. And the models are showing five feet and up everywhere in the next 72 hours in the Sierras. And we'll get to that. But first, let's check out the snowfall analysis for the last 24 hours. You can see most of the snow up in the upper peninsula here and as well as the northwest, including Idaho, Montana, Washington, Oregon, and Northern California. But the 72-hour totals are epic. And the U.S., well, the albedo is increasing. Here are the 72-hour numbers, and let's just blow this up. You can see those dark maroon areas. These are areas with over three feet of snow, some areas picking up four feet or more up in Washington State. We have three feet or more in Oregon, three, four, three feet or more in Idaho, three feet or more in multiple localities in Colorado, southern Wyoming, and even southern Utah picking up three feet or more, and more is coming, and skiers, they're not bumming. Unsettled across the western U.S., critical fire weather conditions for the southern high plains. If you watch some of our podcasts from yesterday, wow, it was windy. We were in the big windy a few days ago, and it was windy. <laughs> I, did I say it was windy? We were down here uh, by the Mexican border, by Texas, right here by El Paso, just about 100 miles north, and that's where we spent a few days Check out those videos. Now, coastal rain and high elevation snow are expected from the Pacific Northwest into portions of California and eastward <whistles> to the Northern Rockies through Monday. Locally heavy rainfall in parts of Central and Southern California could cause flooding. Meanwhile, dry weather and gusty winds will result in critical fire weather conditions for much of the Southern High Plains through Monday. And snow, ho, 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 snow is coming. And no one's bumming, unless you don't like snow. So if we walk this through, here is our Sunday. There's going to be heavy snow in the northern Sierras all the way up the spine through the Cascades all the way up into BC. So that snow is ongoing and will be happening through Monday and will continue all day Monday into Tuesday. Take a look at by Tuesday morning, four feet of snow in most of the Sierras. You're going to have avalanche warnings, flooding in the valleys. It will be epic. A little bit of snow up here in the northern tip of Maine, but nothing much as the storm continues to move south and east down the Rockies. On Wednesday, take a look into Utah, into Colorado, into Arizona, into New Mexico, and moving east. That's the first system. Second system hits the northeast by December 18th. And take a look at this. The southern system next week may bring heavy snow to central Texas. This has been on the models for days now. It's moderating, but it's still there. And so I think there's going to be a big Texas event sometime around next weekend. So stay tuned for that. And if we just progress the models forward, you could see it's looking like, well, quite a white Christmas for many people. Over 40 states with snow on the ground for Christmas, 45 to be exact. And that's a boom. Seismic update. No quakes of note, except at the triple junction down here, we do have the Earth continuing to get larger, 6.5 in Macquarie Island. Another triple junction, 5.0 in the South Sandwich Islands. We've got a frack quake right there. And take a look. Nothing going up here on the Blanco fracture zone. That event is over. And absolutely nothing happening on the Cascadia megathrust because the, the faults are not related. So anyone who claimed that there was a relationship from the Blanco fracture zone to the Cascadia megathrust is full of doo-doo. Or fear porn, whatever you want to call it. Now, La Palma update. The eruption continues gradually decreasing in intensity ever after as we've been predicting and the telemetry shows the same today there has been in the last 24 hours we're talking 
just 27 earthquakes total, some of the lowest numbers ever since the eruption began, which is excellent news. And better news is there are almost no quakes at depth, almost no quakes at all at any depth. Here's a three-dimensional tomography of those quake positions. The islands up here, the red denotes the lava flows. Here you can see the upper magma chamber, which is very depleted in seismic activity over the last three days. The lower magma chamber has almost completely quieted down. This would be indicative of the end of the eruption. Whenever all the rest of this activity gets pinched out at the surface, the volcano should come to rest. Now, something interesting happened just a few hours ago. And this is uh, pretty typical of volcanoes. And you can see here over the last several weeks, there are paroxysms of seismicity here that go up and down. We've been at a very low level for days. You can see here, very low level. But there has been two paroxysms now ongoing at the volcano, which means that the upper magma chamber could be angry and is trying to burp out any remaining magma, calling an end to the eruption. Now, Davidoff Volcano... One of the furthest western volcanoes in the United States on the Aleutians, very close to Kamchatka. Seismic swarm allowing the volcanic alert level to be raised to yellow. Now, yellow is just restless, and very little is known about this volcano. Some hypothesize that it erupted in the Holocene, but this eruption would have been VEI-5, VEI-6, could be VEI-7. This is a gigantic crater in Crater Bay, but clearly... The island is active and the alert level has been raised to yellow. Again, once again, there is very little activity. There is no information scientifically on eruptive history. And the Global Volcanism Program is not aware of any Holocene eruptions of Davidoff. But other scientists have published information on this volcano, which is at the very tippy tip of the Aleutians and very close to the Kamchatka Peninsula. So we're keeping a close eye on Davidoff because it's quite interesting. And that's boom. But we're not done. We have some interesting science to end the podcast with. A large eruption from a nearby star is a warning for Earth. And this coming into, well, some of the mainstream rags. A star over 100 light years away in the constellation of Draco is teaching us a few unsettling things about our own sun. The star, E.K. Draconis, recently surprised researchers when it launched into an explosive light show more energetic than anything observed from our local star, now, if our sun erupted in the same way, without warning, just like E.K. Draconis, it would be seriously bad for news for our electric grids and satellites, as well as life on Earth. So, this is soft disclosure to the public on what is possible and what will be coming from our sun in the near future. If you want to know more, I'll leave you links to E.K. Draconis facts, type distance, magnitude, age, color, luminosity, location, and more below the video, where all the links are. Now, astronomers have discovered why the solar system might be shaped like a croissant. Well, because it's French. Probably not. Could be Beauchamp. Could be cosmic rays. Could be the galactic wave approaches from this angle. And constantly, we have a Beauchamp effect similar. Well, you know what I'm talking about. Read the paper. Ancient DNA discovered... Discovery reveals woolly mammoths. Now, these people are geniuses. They took some tablespoons of soil that they had dated, and they looked for genetic evidence of what was alive on the surface. Similar to Mud Fossil University, who takes samples of sedimentary rocks and claims there's DNA of animals in it, therefore the rock that looks like an animal is the animal. You almost have to be a third grader to believe that science, because all the science proves is what animals were around at that time. Not that the rock that you're sampling is that animal. You would have to be an absolute idiot to believe that. <laughs> but the other way around, if we took a sample of dirt and found hundreds of species of genetic material in there, we could assume that those species were alive at the time and that their skin cells were blowing around the surface of the earth. Did you know if you vacuum your rug, you would find hundreds of millions of skin cells lying there and you could do genetic tests and prove that people live in your house? It's amazing how they do that. Now, the fate of sinking tectonic plates has long puzzled scientists and it still puzzles them because they found an answer using a computer model and an outcrop of sedimentary rocks, which are completely unrelated. What you're looking at above here is a geologic uh, phenomena called boutonnage, where you get this lenticular pinching of what was once a continuous unit. 
See the unit down below where this fella is sitting? That's the same unit as above, but because of tectonic stresses and pressures, the upper sands pinched out these lenticular forms because of stresses. Now, they ran a model and they imagined that that's the same thing plates do as they fall into the earth. There is no relationship to this sedimentary outcrop, the tectonic feature of boudinage here and in this model. They're completely unrelated. One is a tectonic force here of one plate pushing under another, and this is sedimentary forces and then post-pressure and temperature tectonic forces on the sedimentary rock. So very confusing that they would even make this article at SciTech Daily because they're just simply showing you that this picture looks like this picture, but they're not related and they don't prove anything. And this stuff down here that they claim proves they know what a plate does when it gets subducted is based on computer models and nonsense. It's complete fantasy and fairy tale. And that is the state of science today. Hey, hey, five tips on how to escape an erupting volcano. Tip number one, don't live near one. Tip number two, don't live near one. Tip number three, <laughs> If diamond's warning you a volcano may erupt, leave the area. Tip number four, don't live near where a, a volcano may erupt. And tip number five, if a volcano erupts, run away from the eruption, not towards it, for a selfie. And that's a boom. Proper prior planning prevents piss poor performance. In a dystopian world where the general public runs towards the eruption, we run away. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Share this with like-minded people. Be safe. We love you. Tonight, there's going to be an amazing podcast on the Decalogue Stone in Las Lunas, New Mexico. So stay tuned for that and tune in. I'll be there. Will you? Mm -hmm.